Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Facebook Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. I have a guest on today who I met back at the Plant-Based World Expo in New York, the very first one, and uh, it was a great expo, and I got to meet lots of really cool people, including Katie Owens, my guest today. Uh, Katie has is the co-founder of Plantcraft, a plant-based meat alternative company that makes delicious uh, deli slices and pâtés, and I'm sure she's got some more things on the horizon as well. Thank you for joining us from tomorrow in New Zealand. I hope the future looks bright for us tomorrow. Good morning, and thank you so much for having me. And it's a great honor to be here. I'm a big fan of your show. And I was wondering, what am I doing on this show? Because you have such awesome, prominent guests, and I'm a big fan of everything you do. And I hope that I can uh, contribute something to your podcast and your audience. Well, you've made some tremendous progress since we first met just uh, probably a little over a year and a half ago. Um, your acceleration into the market has been eye popping. It's been a pleasure to watch your growth and your success. And I applaud you because you're really leading the way for other people. And you're doing some things quite differently. And But before we talk about and dive into plant craft and some of the things that you're doing there, uh, let's start with your vegan story. How did you become vegan? What's, you know, what spurred you to be, make the change? And then how did you not only take that vegan of a personal uh, choice into wanting to expand that into uh, a vegan business? Yeah. Um, personal story is, um, is quite interesting because I'm originally from Hungary. Uh, my background is Hungarian. I'm sure you didn't pick the accent, but I actually do have an accent and that's from East Europe. Um, and Hungarians eat meat with meat and then they top it with some more meat and then just for some extra flavor, they add some uh, sour cream and then cheese. And it's that's the part of uh, deeply ingrained in the culture. Mm -hmm. And that was very normal and natural to me and that, that was my cultural heritage. And um, about 10 years ago, I started uh, fostering dogs and uh, rescue dogs and just helping them. Uh, get back to uh, working with an uh, organization that was rescuing dogs from the chain. So I had to rehab these dogs. They were quite antisocial and slightly crazy. And I foster failed one, which means I ended up adopting it uh, or her. And she's still uh, my dog. And I was just cuddling her on, on the couch. And then uh, she just stretched her back leg towards me and it looked like a big, juicy Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I told her like, yum, you're like KFC, yum, I'm gonna devour you. And that moment, the whole thing just came down, collapsing down on me. It, it was really, really odd. And then I started looking into that and I saw um, uh, very angry people talking to um, Chinese, um, consumers who are uh, traditionally eating dog meat mm -hmm. and they were raging about how dare you eat dog meat and and then th there was a very genuine Chinese lady who said that uh, you know this is part of my culture it's natural it's normal it's tasty and we've always been doing that and all of a sudden I realized that I say the same about cows or pigs or chickens and so that was a very personal story for me and it was very um, uh, shaking, shaking my whole world because everything that I believed was true just came collapsing down. So back then I thought that, uh, I actually seriously thought that I, humans can't live without meat. And so I embraced myself for a long life of suffering when my, I will perish away, but I will do that even if I will have a miserable life. And uh, unbeknown to me that uh, I, I will actually have a much more interesting uh, diet with uh, uh, abundance of color and it will be just amazing. So I didn't know that, but I was ready to do that. So I started that for, for the animals, actually for Roxy, uh, my re rescue dog. But uh, later on, uh, of course, I learned a lot about the uh, health aspect and then the environment. 
and and so now I'm I'm truly working for all all these aspects and the food uh, system problems as well. So you were working probably I'm guessing like in the like most of us in the corporate world and and the the business world um, under a different profession. Yeah. When when did the that that period where you say, well, wait a minute, can I apply some of this to something, something that more aligns with my ethics and values now that they've changed? Yeah, that was a very um, scary time for me, actually, because uh, I was running a digital agency, advertising agency, um, my, my own company. And first, I, of course, made it vegan. So I didn't make a big deal out of it, but we were serving rice milk in, in the office. And whenever there was a, a gathering, then we ordered in vegan pizzas. And, you know, if you needed snacks, then we had the vegan chocolate bars. So nothing special, but I was running a vegan business. And of course, I said no to any um, client that that had values that were not aligned with with ours but especially in New Zealand where our agriculture our whole um, economy revolves around animal agriculture especially dairy and and lamb so um, and then wool so it's it's like um, wh whichever direction you go you will have sooner or later you'll have a client who will ask you to um, to advertise their products that are not aligned with, with you. So I, I was having this conflict more and more. And, and I realized that I can't, if it's not going to be a viable business if I keep saying no to clients. Um, so instead of uh, transitioning into something else, I decided to close down my business and open up the space for something. So that was really scary. I didn't have a plan B. I just... Wow closed it down and, and moved to a big empty space. Looking back now from where your your point of view is, uh, obviously you're having some, some major successes, so it, the story turned for a good. But during that time, what experiences were you going and, and what was it that helped you get your bearings and, and find yourself moving in a direction that really felt good again? Um, I think it's uh, it's your internal values. Mm -hmm. There is nothing as motivating. You can't pile up as much money that will motivate you as much as thinking of the animals or the health or the, the environment or this planet. So even if it's really rough, I don't think I would wake up those mornings for money. But I do wake up for for what's in my heart for my for the for the mission. So I think um, it it actually makes it very easy. It's uh, it's much easier than than anything else. I I truly feel like almost like um like a guardian that it's my duty that I have to do it and and maybe I'm only making a very little tiny little change, but maybe that will be that last tiny little grain that will tip the scales to the right direction so it's a a mission is something that that uh, i i really recommend that if someone hasn't found it yet then then try to find that in your heart because that's something that that will keep you going no matter what so you got this renewed motivation you you've got experience in the work world but maybe it may not be applying to exactly the way you want to do it to the point where you've just actually just said no i'm not going to do it anymore you yeah. had your own business and you actually shut it down so now that you're aligning yourself with your values what got you to that aha moment where you said i'm going to start plant craft this is what i want to yeah. do yeah <laughs> One morning I woke up and I said, playing crap. No, it was actually um, a lot of um, different things just aligning in a, in a weird manner. And I'm somewhat of a spiritual person. And I, I must say that if, if, if you really let go of, of your ego wanting to control everything, then things will actually come and happen in the right way and, and synchronicity will happen and some weird coincidences will happen. And I really experienced that with, with my mission. So, but of course, we, you have to put in the work as well. So um, 
while I was running my uh, my agency, I felt like I have to do something meaningful. So I was um, uh, I, I I studied to become a transitional coach, a vegan transition coach, uh, meaning that um, I was helping people transitioning over to a vegan diet. It's uh, I, I did that for Challenge Twenty Two. It's a twenty two day. Um, um, challenge or experience where there are coaches that, that are training people in Facebook groups uh, or, or uh, individually and help them um, transition to a vegan lifestyle. Uh, you probably know that yourself, that you have the craziest questions uh, coming <laughs> up. And even though you're trained about ethics and whatnot, at the end, it will be the main question will be, but what do I eat? Mm -hmm. And and there is that big gap between people thinking that you can basically eat grass and sticks and leaves, and then and then the abundance of beautiful foods that you can eat. And I was there to help, kind of bridge that gap. And um, that was about four or five years ago when I was doing that. And there were already quite a few good products out there on the market, but they were all focusing on. On your dinner plate really so burgers barbecues um, burgers um, sausages and there was absolutely nothing I could recommend when people said okay but what do I do as a pet lunch uh, what do I put in between two slices of bread um, and you know there is only so much hummus and, and celery bun that you can eat um, and there wasn't really much on the market that I could recommend for them. There are some amazing old players um, who have been, you know, the Tofurky and Lightlife and, and those companies that are the great pioneers of, of this category. But even they are not focusing on, on, on slices or deli meat anymore. It's it, it's almost like an underdog of, of the meat market right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's overlooked. It's undervalued. No one's really thinking of it. But if you actually look at your everyday habits, then you will have a sandwich. There are people who have sent a sandwich every day, and you need that convenience, the grab and go. Uh, we, we're running around. Even with, during lockdown, we would be running on, around, and we would have to grab something. And that's the the convenience that that the deli meats have, that you don't have to cook it, you don't have to do anything, you just grab it, eat it, and go. And I realized that there is a gap there. So I was already thinking about that, and I was I was kind of my brain was out there looking for a solution. And that's when I uh, met Chaba, my co-founder, who later became uh, my co-founder at Plancraft. And he was just uh, reaching out to me, looking for marketing and branding help for, for a new um, IP that he has acquired in his pasta factory. So totally unrelated. And we were talking about this new IP and I was trying to help um, as a, just as a consultant to, to build that brand. And then my brain just started going like, hey, guys, this IP is amazing. We can make anything, confectionery, pasta, um, you know, baking mixes, and it's amazing. And the, the nutritional value finally is amazing, and it's not just a bunch of crap. And I was like, why don't we make meat out of it? And, of course, the there was a little bit of resistance, but – Took me a while to convince the team that that making meat is the right way to go, and then at the end of that um, contract, Chaba said that, "Hey, why don't you convert your fees into ownership and let's start the company together?" And so that's what I did. Well, and and what timing too, right? As mm -hmm. as the alternative meat category was just beginning to explode, yeah. with players like Impossible and Beyond Meat just. And, and Gardein just really exploding on the scene. Uh, and even international brands in Europe and stuff like that really starting to play dominance. 
But at the same time, you know, definitely I know the intention of those companies was to target the mainstream audience that was not vegan, really. It was more products targeted to them to try to get them to say, hey, that's familiar enough to me. That's similar enough to what I'm already eating. I can yeah. make a change over there. I can make a switch. And to me, that's really important for the entire movement because that's who really needs you know, that can make the greatest impact both on the animals and the environment is the 95% that aren't plant-based. Absolutely. So that was really important, but I think, you know, in, in, in trying to move the needle and the focus so much on whatever it takes to make it like their products, that they, they really sacrificed a little bit in the integrity of the product itself. And I know many vegans uh, really don't like that hyper-processed and, and, and sometimes questionable ingredients that went into it. And that's why I so love what you're doing. You're not only in this space, but you've attacked it so differently. Please share that and talk about what makes your, your product so unique in the marketplace. Before going into that, I would like to just uh, protect and defend the, the plant-based, uh, other plant-based players, because I think a lot of that bashing is coming from, from the meat mm -hmm. lobby. And I, I think that um, we vegans pick it up quite a bit and we pick it up quite unnecessarily sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, some of the criticism that, uh, for example, Beyond Meat gets, it's not, mm -hmm. It's not as bad if you really look into the nutrition profile. It's still, it's still a, a very great effort, and I think we we are overreacting that, and we are just kind of responding to the meat lobby's um, desperate um, effort to or attempt to to undermine uh, vegan foods, um, especially. And I often talk to uh, meat eaters who who are telling me that oh, but look at these products, they have so many ingredients and all of these things. Uh, and I tell them, okay, next time you go to the grocery store, just flip your um, ham package and look what what is in that your actual ham that you think you're eating a piece of meat. Look at it and look at all the ingredients and you will see that, wow, okay, it's still a much better alternative to, to have, even if it's a processed um, meat, um, meat uh, alternative. But having said that, we, we were really focusing on, on bringing something to market that is not just not bad, but actually good for you. So um, we are trying to create, first of all, using ingredients that are uh, superfoods or, or um, really beneficial ingredients like uh, green bananas. Green banana is, is an amazing substance. It's, um, it's a resistant starch. So it almost works like uh, a fiber in your body. It carries uh, all the nutrients all the way. It's a, it, it's medicine for the gut, mm -hmm. and um, and it has high potassium and a lot of uh, micronutrients. Uh, we're really focusing on on our micronutrients as opposed to uh, you know proteins and and sugars. Um, and our our um, protein profile, the amino acid profile, is also complete. We've just um, recently uh, done our uh, lab tests to to confirm that. So um, we have um, selected our protein sources to to meet that uh, demand as well. So we have all the essential amino acids coming from sunflower protein peas, chickpeas, and flax protein, so or linseed, or whatever you call it in your uh, region. Flax, so, <laughs> flax, okay. So, uh, so flax is, um, is, is just a, another great compound. And then we also use some upcycled ma materials, like um, um, our, our oil, because uh, we need some oil in these products. Our oil is um, uh, coming from uh, grapes, grapeseed, which is discarded by the winemaking industry. And uh, to create that, that yummy texture, that uh, kind of elasticness, we're using uh, citrus fiber, which is a byproduct of uh, uh, the orange juice industry. So we, we're trying to, to 
uh, wrap in as much goodness as possible, both nutritionally and from a sustainability point of view. That's wonderful. Now, when you're talking about green bananas, that's not something you generally read. On no. the back of the I mean, no. I had green bananas today in my smoothie just because I love the resistant starch attribute. And yeah. for those of you out there who don't know, it's a, an amazing prebiotic um, and actually has been shown to help you actually lose weight. So yeah. great if you're trying to get out there and improve your fitness level, but also uh, in, increase your body body's fat burning capability, but also feeding your gut microbiome at the same time. So beautiful thing, but, but that's not typically, you know, you pick up a package of, of one of the general meat alternatives and it's mostly protein isolates from grains. And when yeah. you're talking seeds, legumes, herbs and spices and green bananas, this is not the general list that most people it's use. It's true. <laughs> so but, most, the most, the, the biggest reason for it is because it's very hard bloody hard to create something that looks like meat out of these powders, mm -hmm. these flowers. So um, that is just really thanks to that uh, um, food IP, the food tech IP that we have, that, mm -hmm. that it allows us to formulate very um, unexpected combinations of, of ingredients uh, that we can turn into uh, meat. But the, the other part is that um, if you create, if you want to create um meat alternative then you you kind of need a bulk a filler material to to carry the whole product which which would be either wheat uh gluten which we we don't use because we are uh, allergen free would would be uh, gluten free would be soy but we also soy free mm -hmm. or if you don't use soy or gluten you would you would be able to use your full like a pea protein isolate, which which happens quite a lot, but it's heavily processed as well. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't do that, you are left with starches, which would be if you do look at any um, traditional um, first generation deli slice from the true hippie era. Um, mm -hmm. back in the 80s, 90s, that would be uh, probably uh, based on maize starch or rice starch, mm -hmm. and that would be kind of the bulk of the, of the uh, product. And then they would add the spices and some of the protein. So following that thinking, we were looking at something that could work like a, a filler material for us but instead of being an empty starch that just breaks down to sugars right after ingestion uh, we we try to find something that could do the work but healthy on the other hand and so that's that's how we found green bananas so you're talking about food technologies and food research that I'm sure yeah. took a while to get to that magical place where you go, now this tastes great. I know I've worked for um, you know five, six months on a flavor system to get it right, working with novel ingredients like the lentine and our protein, which is very tough, very green, very hard to cover and make it taste good. So I know how difficult that process and how long that can take. So this kind of drives me to my next question is with all that money, all that time going into development and research and testing and, and flavor systems and development, how do you fund something like that for people out there looking to get into a business? That can be very difficult that, you know, generally people don't have a lot of money uh, to start with. And when they get into a business, they want to hit the ground running and start selling right away. You're talking about a business that took, I'm guessing, a while to go through the development process. Talk about your experience with the VC, uh, Venture Capital, and yeah. with uh, ProVeg, which was the incubator. What was that experience like and how did that help you get from point A to a finished product? Um. What I can first share, and and first and foremost, it's good to be a Gen Xer. It's good to be old and successful because it means that uh, we actually had some of our um, own funds to play with, uh, and that if if you are in a position to be able to do that and bootstrap some of the process, then it helps you get through the first hurdle when you are only selling an idea, 
and not an actual um, product or product prototype. And it's um, it, it gave, gave us a big advantage. So first of all, um, if you're already a successful entrepreneur, then just use your skills, transfer those skills. They are transferable easily. Um, and if you're brave enough, use some of your money because, uh, you know, if the world goes down, your money won't. Uh, have any worth anyway so that is my my first advice but of course if you're young and you're just starting out then you will really have to build a very compelling story and i would recommend to look out look into the field of research because researchers are usually not people who can bring a product to market they are contrasting skills they don't have that um ability to do so there might be a lot of amazing technology that is just sitting there that people who invented them or work them out they don't understand how to put it to market or how to how to turn it into a into a product like our product originally was uh, baking mixes and pastas and i wouldn't be here talking to you um, if we were still making uh, pastas which were great products by the way it's just a different timing and a different need in the market mm -hmm. and so if you don't have uh, resources then um, be resourceful in a different way and, and look into research that is going on right now um, and then second step of course was um, um, the incubation that we received from uh, ProVeg and there are a lot of incubators and accelerators out there but I can really recommend uh, ProVeg they are extremely mission driven um, their goal is to reduce uh, animal agriculture by 50% by 40. So it's a 50 by 40 uh, mission. Um, and they have the uh, amazing Melanie Joy uh, right there in, um, in Berlin. And if you remember how starstruck I was when I met you in the, in the <laughs> expo, Last year, well, imagine me uh, looking at Melanie Joy walking in the door, and I was like, "Oh my God!" My heart was fluttering, um, and and they are extremely well connected, and it's a true mission over profit uh, approach, so impact over profit, and it's just such a such a great uh, environment to be in when you you are working for a for a greater cause and and then all the other people who are working around you are doing the same and you could be talking to your direct competitor about how you can talk to or how you can help each other and i'm i'm coming from a world where i was working with tech startups and you know the environment is definitely not like that there's a very tough competition there but um, it's just a refreshing, healthy, and natural way to be able to work like this. So I also would recommend that wherever stage you are, expand that help towards others. So someone who is just behind you, just keep, keep the ladder down so that others can climb after you and that will pay back tremendously. Yeah, and I would like to take the opportunity to offer my help to anyone who is somewhat behind us in the development. Uh, just reach out to me on social media and uh, if I can help, I'll help. That beautiful. I feel the same way. We we do give backs every quarter to support nonprofits yeah. um, that are in the plant-based community. Um, I always feel that my success means a greater ability to help others uh, coming up behind me with other great ideas. I do consulting as well. So uh, I consult with other companies. Even I've consulted, like you said, direct competitors in the exact same space. And I'm happy yeah. to because I feel we're all on the same team with the same mission. Yes. The real competition is the ignorance that is out there. And I don't mean that word ignorance in any disrespectful way. I was ignorant. I didn't understand what I was doing for the first 22 years of my life. I had no idea what I was contributing to in, in environmental degradation and the harm and suffering of animals. I did not know. I was ignorant. So I, I mean that in the most respectful way that I think those who have that light bulb moment, who have that uh, awakening, 
you like you said earlier in the piece, you feel obligated to want to pay that forward, right? I mean, something that you feel so good and proud about, it's just natural to want to share that with people who you care about and, and all people in general, because it is such a positive force in our lives. And I love that our movement is so supportive, does see by and large the greater good for the movement itself. And there's not as much, uh, look, I came from the traditional environment and the supplement space and the natural product space, where there was heavy old school top down management and you know beat the other guy at all costs by bad mouthing him and making, it's just horrible. And it, business doesn't have to be that way we can be supportive of each other and a high tide lifting all boats. And I really believe that. And, and that's why I love having an opportunity to put together a show like this, where I get to talk to other vegan entrepreneurs that are also embracing that ethic, not only in their own personal ethic and the movement ethic, but also in the ethic and applying that in the business world, because really that is setting another example. Hey, we can do business in a very progressive manner that is really supportive of other people, supportive of other cultures, genders, uh, and species, obviously, uh, that, that is a win, win, win for everyone. And, um, so I, I truly love what you're doing. Okay. So, so you got some amazing funding. Congratulations on that. Uh, I, I know that that capital I've been in the vent, venture capital space before, and it can be a little, little, little tough, a little bruising. Um, uh, but uh, definitely there are very supportive uh, groups out there, uh, vegans who have made major successes and are turning that into returning some of that back to supporting other industries that doesn't require such a bottom line driven focus, for profit only focus, and really supporting industries, supporting small business startups and entrepreneurs in the business. So that Ha, that funding has allowed you some growth and now you're global, going global. <laughs> so talk about that. And and obviously we're here in the United States and uh, talk about the potential and the, the experience of coming to the US. Yeah. So we didn't really start out to be global from the get go. We wanted a global, we wanted to be a global company in terms of um, we didn't want to be a Hungarian company or New Zealand or a US company, but we didn't want to tackle all the markets at the same time. Um, that was definitely not our strategy. Um, we first wanted to start small in maybe Germany or somewhere around uh, incubation where we were in, uh, in Berlin. And we got selected by ProVeg to, to represent them in uh, Seeds and Chips. Um, Part of the Tutto Food Festival in, in Milan. It's the biggest expo uh, in the food space. And um, the, the director of the incubator accidentally just tasted our first samples as they arrived into the incubator. And he was like, oh my God, this is great. This must go out to, uh, to, to the expo. And so we had basically two weeks to prepare to, to get ready to be present <laughs> at an expo. Uh, basically the ink wasn't even dry on our, on, on our business cards and we didn't even have a logo or anything. And we were just pushed in the middle of it and it was an amazing show and it has a big international um, uh, turn up and uh, we had some uh, American uh, investors and and uh, consultants and specialists um, and professionals coming out um, even met some of the original uh, food technologists behind Beyond Meat and they were tasting our product and we were just looking like, oh my God, what's going to happen now? Uh, and we had great feedback and a lot of investors came to us and said, guys, you can't, you can't play small. You have to come to the US because we need this thing. This is amazing. Right. And so that was two months before um, Plant Based World Expo where we met. And that was a great expo. It was the, such a great vibe. And it's, it, it feels so good that we were able to be part of that uh, 
um, historical moment and that I bumped into you. Actually, you don't know that. Um, you've been a legend for me for a long time because oh. um, uh, I was part of a vegan coaching and, uh, you know, vegan sports. And, of course, nutrition comes with that. So um, um, I already knew your product in New Zealand and in Barbados. And I'm sure, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. And... Um, and so that, that's why I was so starstruck when I saw you in, the, in that expo. That was great. Um, and so uh, from there, we started building our uh, US operations and, um, of course, made, uh, made connections, first of all, to, to build um, a model where, where we can do production. So we spent about six months to get procurement and co-manufacturing underway. And we've just recently closed our um, first uh, trials uh, with success. So uh, we are getting ready to, to start packaging and, and uh, hitting the market hopefully early next year in the United States. So we will be able to uh, purchase this here in the United yes, States. You will. Yes, you will be, <laughs> and um, and we're super excited about that. So our first products will be uh, uh, the pate, which is going to be an interesting challenge because it's not something you guys really know or eat. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 a meaty spread that is a, a staple uh, ingredient for every European. Um, especially when you're a child, you just have that on, on your sandwich. And, and then when, when you want to go fancy, you have those little canapes with, with a little meaty spread on top. So that's, that's something that we're super excited about. And, and we hope that the uh, um, U.S. Will, will love the product. And the other is uh, pepperoni. So we are bringing our pepperoni out first. And then, um, then we'll follow. These are more uh, like the deli slices, right? So yes, sandwich exactly. Slices. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, in the, U the U.S., pepperoni is these tiny little uh, things that yeah. go on pizza. So. <laughs> yeah, we do that as well. So that oh. these will go on, on pizza as well. And then we're working on uh, on getting our ham-like slices to to the market as fast as we can. So uh, yeah, um, our lab is super busy right now. Exciting and so the story, what, how we got global, that's, I think, quite an interesting story, too, because um, uh, we were in the middle of uh, the U.S. Uh, preparations when uh, when COVID hit. And that was a pretty scary time for us. And I got stranded here in New Zealand and Chubba was in, in Hungary. And we didn't know if we could ever even travel and how is it going to be? How can you do trials? How can you do tasting when you're not allowed to travel so that was pretty right. scary and um, we decided to come up with a plan b and a plan c so while i was stranded here in new zealand um, i worked on a i developed a plan for and uh, identified uh, co-manufacturing partners and procurement and uh, and business channels uh, here in new zealand and australia and chaba did the same for europe and then uh, as we emerged on the other side of the first lockdown, uh, we realized that we, we now have three different plans that we can execute mm -hmm. any moment. So that basically gives us a platform to be uh, global quite fast. And um, our strategy is to, to use people that we really trust and, and rely on in each, um, each country. So our strategist here in uh, uh, the U.S. is David Benzikin, who you might have heard of uh, from Ocean Huggers and Plan Based Solutions. He's 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 great. Um, we are really mission, really mission aligned, and and he's just giving us uh, great great guidance, and um, we're relying on him quite a lot and trust him and work with him in the US. And then we, we, we're going to do the same, um, trying to find someone, a key person for each region as we grow. So the expansion to America and everything you've got, you're on three continents right now in, in yeah. production and manufacturing. 
that's a tall task for somebody who started out as a big entrepreneur. And um, yeah, I'm guessing that you've expanded both in your personnel as well as, um, um, so what is next for you? Uh, what's on the horizon in the near future and, and where do you see yourself in a few years? Um, me, myself, as a, as a human. Um, <laughs> Both, as a person and a, as, as a person a owner and of a company. As an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. yeah, for the company, really, uh, we really want it to grow uh, global and pretty strong. And the aim is very easily measurable. We want to pull as many animal products off the shelves as we can. So that is the, that is the pure aim. And... Uh, and so that's why we're working really hard on that. In, in my personal um, personal cha challenges or more like goals, um, I've just uh, uh, got that for in a fortunate situation to to move in the countryside in New Zealand, nice. and um, and my current challenge is to find find enough time between all the work that I'm doing to start building a permaculture. Uh, food forest for myself and my family. So those are the exciting uh, things that are keeping me keeping me busy um, as a as a person. But yes, uh, in terms of the business, we we want to make sure that we we build a very strong leg in uh, in the United States, and that's what we are focusing on. And uh, on the other side of the elections, and on the other side of the current uh, COVID. Uh, situation. We're hoping that it will now become a stable, strong and stable um, market for for us to keep building the brand. I am so excited for you. Your growth <laughs> is admirable. That you have uh, been able to pivot through COVID, through lots of global changes. Um, and that you've been able to rise to the top and really differentiate yourselves in the marketplace, meeting a need that wasn't there, uh, becoming innovative in your approach to uh, a very super clean product, which I think is really uh, more and more of a focus uh, for consumer demand. So thank you for everything you're doing. How can people follow you, get in touch with you, social media, um, and if whatever contact information you're willing to share so that people can follow and keep in touch with you. Yeah, our website is plancraft.com. So uh, that is probably the easiest. And from there, you can uh, find our Instagram account, which is Plantcraft Food. And our uh, Facebook is also Plantcraft Food. But I recommend following Instagram because we have uh, juicy stories coming up and a lot of behind mm -hmm. the scene. Uh, which, which is, uh, and, and especially once we're getting ready to, to launch, then all the information about when and where will be available, it's going to be uh, Instagram will be the place to go. Well, I really look forward to trying the American product when it comes out, and I will for sure be telling everybody about it. Um, Thank you. a pleasure to have you on. So good to see you again after all this time. to see you. Yeah. I can't help but really uh, bubble up with excitement for all of your growth and success. And thank you for all you're doing for this movement and leading the way, both in the clean food movements, um, the animal movements, and I love the upcycling and repurposing of waste products. Food waste is a big issue dear to my heart. So thank you for what you're doing for the environment, for the animals, and, and obviously for the movement. And more success to you and keep growing. And I'll be watching and following you for sure. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank you. Watch for our next uh, Facebook Lives. We'll have some more amazing guests. Uh, I'd like to thank Katie again for uh, coming from all the way side the world from tomorrow uh, in New Zealand to, to be on the show for you today. I hope you got some out of this. I hope it inspires you to possibly uh, start up your own business or veganize your current uh, mode of um, uh, making money. So wherever you add in your workspace, wherever you add in your fitness space, try to be more plant-based and incorporate that for your own health, for the health of the animals and for the planet. Thanks for joining me. I hope you had learned a lot.